Welcome to Hot Chips 30. Session 6. New Technologies. Well, good morning again. I'm going to try to keep us on time, so uh, going to get going on, on this session, uh, new technologies. We've got uh, two new technologies to tell you about this morning that are pretty interesting. Um, <clears throat> before the first speaker, I've been asked to make an announcement. Um, De Anza is now a uh, non-smoking campus, uh, and that includes the outside. Um, we have one exception which is the balcony above the front entrance. So if you're a smoker, you're asked to uh, go there in order to, uh, to uh, engage. <clears throat> um, our, um, our first uh, talk is Architecture for Carbon Nanotube-Based Memory by uh, Bill Gervasi. Um, <clears throat> Bill is a pr principal systems architect at Nantero been working with memory devices and subsystems since one kilobit DRAMs and EEPROMs were the leading edge memory technology. He's been a JDAC chairman since 1996 and responsible for uh, <clears throat> things like DDR, S, SDRAM, um, and a number of other uh, standards. Um, he was previously at uh, Intel and Transmeta, uh, did educational work at University of Portland and the Oregon Graduate Center. Um, Bill? Thank you. Carbon nanotube memory. It sounds so sexy, I feel like I should just shut up and not say anything, but I have a fear that you'd run me off the stage if I did that. So I think I'll give you a little bit more detail than just that. So what I'm gonna do is run through the basics of how carbon nanotube memory works and show you some of the internal testing uh, and analysis details that we've done in terms of how it works, what the uh, resistive measurements look like that allow us to turn it into a memory cell, among other things. Going to talk about write endurance and timing and temperature, a bunch of other parameters about how this thing works. And then I want to now take that technology description and translate that to more system level effects, like. When the DRAM goes away, what are you going to do? And um, I think we have a nice solution to help replace the DRAM in the industry. <clears throat> so with that, I'm going to introduce a new term, memory clash storage, and justify why the industry needs this new term. Going to then show you a little bit about some of the system implications of that and uh, translate that to things that could be meaningful to this crowd, especially given the preponderance of artificial intelligence and deep learning talks that we've had this week here. So I do want to disclaim a bit here. Uh, the disclaimer is that we are an intellectual property and design house, a lot like ARM. You can think of us as an ARM for memory technology. So what I'm going to be showing you is a description of the technology and the reference designs that we are involved with However, uh, the specific details about when this will be going to market and when you can actually buy it, that's controlled by our customers, so it's not like I can make commitments for them. <clears throat> so what does a carbon nanotube-based memory look like? Well, it's based on the van der Waals effects, which I vaguely remember my uh, college teacher explaining as that atomic force that keeps atoms apart when they're apart and keeps them together once they're together. And the van der Waals effect has this barrier that requires energy to cross back and forth over that barrier. So it takes an electrostatic force to make a couple of carbon nanotubes connect, and then once they've connected, they stay connected. 
until an electrostatic force of the opposite charge breaks them apart. And that is the basics of a switch. And so we're not relying on a single carbon nanotube to switch. We have between hundreds and thousands of these in every cell that are forming a stochastic network of resistive elements. So the idea is that we're going to inject a, an electrostatic force to combine thousands of cells together to lower the resistance, and then when we break them apart, we'll increase the resistance of that cell. So here's what it looks like. Uh, all, of the, all of the fun stuff happens near the bottom of the cell. You can see here in this animation that we pull the cells from the bottom up towards the top to create the void that increases the resistance and force them back down to lower the resistance. There are some other things that you can see from this animation that are significant. The part of our magic is how we select the carbon nanotubes we want. They had, we want to have a specific characteristics in terms of the length of the carbon nanotube and the diameter of the carbon nanotube. If they're too long, they would short out the cell and not switch. If they're too short, they can stand vertically and short out and never switch. So we need to have them in that in-between range and, so that they can essentially pivot like a diving board. The other aspect of this is that you notice that we don't let the carbon nanotubes at the top move, and that's because we create a protective barrier there to prevent the metal that sputtered on top of these structures from leaking down and shorting out the cell. So this also shows you something about the manufacturing process, which is almost embarrassingly simple. The way you're going to design and implement a carbon nanotube into logic is that you, you build whatever logic you want downstairs. And it can be on any process you want, and on any process geometry that you want. And what you do is you expose metal contacts, and you literally spin coat the carbon nanotube slurry over the top of the structure. You bake it, sputter metal, etch, and seal, and you're done. It's literally that simple. So what kinds of results do we get from this? Well, like I said, we're going to have th hundreds to thousands of nanotubes switching in every cell, and that gives us a nice 10 to 1 ratio of set to reset states. Now, I just pulled one representative cell out of this, but we see across the entire wafer a pretty consistent uh, range where we can pick a nice sampling point in between for a, a digital cell. That's fairly straightforward. What I've shown on the right, though, is some of our test data that's accumulated over time. And you can see that we have a nice linear slope on the set function that is a function of the inserted voltage and the resistance. So we also have begun the analysis of multi-level cell, and we do have a, a pretty good roadmap to pursue multi-level cell once we get uh, all of the single-level st cell stuff out in the industry and in mass production. <clears throat> How fast is this? Well, we scaled this thing down on multiple processes all the way from 105 nanometers down to 15 nanometers, and we see a pr pretty consistent uh, message all the way across that fundamentally the set and reset is a balanced 5 nanoseconds per bit cell. And running this across billions and billions of cycles, we see those numbers not changing much. Uh, we do have something of a uh, temperature sensitivity that we should highlight, that we do see that at 300 degrees C, our data retention does drop to 300 years. And so uh, you pretty much want to keep this in the 105, 110, 140 degree C range in order to get that 12,000 years of uh, data retention that you were expecting. So does this technology scale? Like I said, we built this across multiple process geometries, and we have a very good uh, idea that this is going to scale 
to at least five nanometer, and we believe that even at one nanometer process technologies, we have enough carbon nanotubes that we can switch. And what we do as we go to the finer process technologies is we simply change the formulation for what we're looking for. The length of the nanotube and the diameter of the nanotube, we shrink it down to align with the process technology that we're targeting. So if our kids or maybe even our grandkids are working on one nanometer process technologies, we're still going to be there. So, like I said, this is process agnostic. You can put whatever process you want. It doesn't even have to be silicon. Uh, on the underlying layers, you're going to build carbon nanotubes on top of that. And what we're seeing with our current design that on 28 nanometer process technology, we're getting four gigabits per layer at, in, a, in roughly a 100 square millimeter die. So what can you do with that? That's not a bad start. That's a market in itself. However, we can also scale this thing by adding more layers. I mentioned that you can simply uh, deposit a layer of carbon nanotubes, a layer of metal and etch. Well, you can repeat that process as many times as your process and your cost structures allow. So with a four, four layers of carbon nanotubes, we have a 16 gigabit device that is uh, pretty much where the, in fact, a, a step ahead of where the mainstream is today in DRAMs. We also support through silicon via die stacking. So there's yet another mechanism for expanding the capacity of these devices. And then like I said, but I'm not gonna go into details, we know that we have a multi-level cell future as well, and so um, the capacities of this, we're initially targeting DRAM capacities, but uh, taking on flash is not necessarily impossible as well. So, what is, where does the rubber hit the road? The design is done for a DDR4 SDRAM replacement device, and we're talking about direct drop-in replacement, the same JETIC footprint, the same timing, and the same performance, including unlimited write endurance. So this gives us an 8 gigabit device with two layers of carbon nanotubes and 16 gigabits with four layers of carbon nanotubes, but that's on a 28 nanometer logic process. As I said, we scale quite nicely to tighter logic processes and or to memory processes, which gives us in a couple of years a 64 gigabit device with four layers, and we could bump that up. We could do eight layers and uh, have a 128 gigabit device. A couple of years after that, when we scale to something like a seven nanometer process, that gives us a capacity per die of up to 512 gigabits. During that same time, the industry will be transitioning from DDR4 to DDR5, which also allows us to stack the die higher. DDR4 is limited to eight die stacks. DDR5 takes us to 16 uh, high die stacks, <clears throat> which allows us to offer a tremendous amount of capacity in every um, placement. So I'm going to argue that this puts us in a whole new category, that either you're a DRAM replacement or you're not. A lot of the uh, focus in the industry lately has been on a term they call storage class memory, or that SNEA is trying to change to persistent memory. But that's kind of like that middle space in the wasteland between DRAM and flash. It's faster than a flash, but it has wear out, so it's non-deterministic, and it's just not a DRAM replacement. We're targeting direct DRAM replacement with performance at or greater than a DRAM, and the unlimited endurance greater than DRAM capacity, since DRAM is pretty much crapping out at, 16 to, uh, at 32 to 64 gigabit. And so um, it's defining a whole new uh, treadmill for the industry to move on. This is your eye chart for the day. It's an internal architecture diagram of how the, we've taken this fundamental technology, and one of the applications for it is to make a DDR4 replacement device. All the blue boxes around the outside, it's your standard DDR4 Phi. It talks RASs and CASs, it talks ODTs, it talks chip selects and addresses and data, and data strobes. 
brings that on chip. However, then we're going to translate that DDR4 interface to our internal tiled architecture. The other functions that we decided to add to this device include uh, things like built-in self-test and, and remapping logic to allow us to do post-package repair. Clearly, that's important. But also, we've decided to add uh, a SecDead ECC engine in the device as our safety net in case we end up with some reliability problems when we get the mass production devices going. This gives us a nice backdoor to um, increase our yield and to uh, increase the, uh, improve the user experience. However, um, you know, it takes time to do ECC. I don't know if many of you re recall, but there was a move to go from DDR4 to DDR4E, and DDR4E stood for ECC. They wanted to add this functionality in the DDR4 generation. Well, we decided to do it and to take on hitting the, D uh, the JETIC standard timings anyway. So one of the ways we did this is that we broke our arrays into tiles. These tiles are four bits high, 64 bits wide, 256 bits long, and we bring our decode logic into this tile, which is built in a standard cross-point structure, but then we bring it out to a set of latching sense amplifiers. And this is kind of a key function because this gives us a non-destructive read. We can now do reads and writes directly to the, the latching sense amps, and since the data is not modified in the carbon nanotube array, we never have to do things like precharge. So the precharge command goes completely away. Pretty cool, right? And so <clears throat> now we're going to do this function on every activation, which means that now if you look at the timing impact of trying to fit ECC into the DDR4 timing window, you see that we take that cycle time of 47 nanoseconds and we beat it by a little bit, but then we break up the component numbers uh, in between. So like we have a faster access time, but a little bit slower uh, RAS to cast time. That RAS to cast time is the part of lead, loading the uh, carbon nanotubes into the sense amps. But then we can, our access time is faster than JETIC standard because it's not as far to go to get the data out to the IOs. Uh, however, the big win is refresh goes completely away. Right now, you think that a DRAM is deterministic, right? Because every time you issue a CAS, 13 and a half nanoseconds later, that data had better be ready. But that's not the only aspect of determinism. At the system level, determinism is also that the DRAM is ready when you need the data. And it's not, because every couple of microseconds, it has to go offline to do refresh. And that refresh it can be up to 15% of the available bandwidth of the memory. So the interesting aspect of having a non-destructive architecture is that we actually get 15% more data at the same clock frequency than a DRAM. Nice little boost. That's about three speed grades in DRAM talk. There are some other things that we've eliminated, like bank group restrictions and so forth, that get us a few extra percentage points of performance. Uh, so I think you'd be really happy with this when you get your hands on it. So now I want to take that and translate that to what that means at the system level. And then, so one of the things, for example, is that you, you just simply can build think standard memory modules. Unbuffered DIMMs, registered DIMMs, load-reduced DIMMs, all of those things just work. You take the DDR4 chip out, you put the NRAM in, and it just works. Those timing parameters I showed on the two slides ago, those are programmed into the SPD that's on every memory module. The system reads that, and it just runs. So it's true plug and play with no change in software. In comparison, the way that the industry is moving towards persistence, which is a topic I haven't really seen addressed much at Hot Chips, but in the memory industry, the transition to persistent memories is a huge topic. And one of the ways that the industry is getting there today is with something called the NVDIMM-N, which takes a DRAM array on power fail. It uh, has a controller that sucks it up and stores it away into flash. 
when power is restored, that data gets loaded back into the DRAM, and then the system is allowed to run. But it means that your shutdown and wake-up times can be a couple of minutes, which is a long time for your server resource to be offline. The NVDIM-P is another vector that is in process in the industry, but it uses a lot of the same concepts. It allows a lot more memory out there, uh, but it's a non-deterministic protocol, so it has some performance hits associated with it, and it still requires that external energy resource to give the module time to flush internal buffers or any external cache memories that are out there. To translate that now to the topics that have been at this Hot Chips conference, if you think about an artificial intelligence engine, some of these guys, like the Nirvana, have 32 gigabytes of DRAM inside the device with a serial pipe to feed it in, and then they're arranged in a toroid. That reload time can be very tremendous to reload those devices on a power fail. If you could swap that out with persistent memory, this model that I'm showing you applies as well. If you go to persistent memory inside your device, you don't have to reload every time there's a power fail, and the parts can be pre-programmed at the factory. And perhaps even more importantly is that if you have a backpropagation engine that's doing deep learning and modifying the models and the weighting factors on the inside, you don't have to checkpoint those. Right now on power fail, you lose all the work in progress. But if you had a persistent memory there, you can now leave that resource intact, and when power is restored, simply resume where you left off. So, a little comparison here of what those procedures look like. So, all of these things require this external energy source, which is going to be either batteries, which people hate, supercapacitors, which people hate, or tantalum capacitors, which eat up so much space that you don't have room for anything else. So all of that stuff can go away uh, in a nice, persistent memory environment. And software is increasingly becoming persistence aware. Uh, this may be new to this audience, or maybe a lot of you guys have already been involved with things like the Windows and the uh, Linux worlds have all ado ad adopted these technologies for mounting persistent memory as a drive in order to get you to, uh, a time to market. However, there's also this direct memory access mechanism that is increasingly popular and getting incorporated into more and more software to allow the application to get directly to the memory and get the full performance benefits of direct memory access. So, what have we gone through? We, we, we see that the carbon nanotube memory is a technology that has many application bases. Uh, we make these intellectual property blocks and, and uh, procedures available for licensing. One of the applications that obviously we've designed is to turn this into a DDR4 compliant device. DDR5 is an obvious follow-on, but this can also be incorporated directly into your own silicon. Imagine that you have an FPGA device and you wanted to add 64 gigabits of data on, right on top of it as a matter of just fabricating it after your design is done for your FPGA. So think of, think of this as a raw technology and the DDR4 application is essentially a, a great proof of concept and a way to make a few bucks uh, to get this technology moving forward faster. <clears throat> uh, this entire concept of having unlimited write endurance and, and the fast timing parameters of a five nanosecond core allows us to define a new concept of a memory class storage. It's a device that operates as a memory but stores the content permanently. And the uh, scalability is way beyond what a DRAM looks like. So I think we have a very comfortable roadmap to be able to replace DRAM for the long term. Uh, the timing is better than a DRAM. So people are also going to be very pleased with the additional throughput that they get from this. And the on-the-fly ECC is going to be a nice safety net to make sure that we get a good, uh, reliable data connection um, from the system level. That data persistence is a growing 
area of interest for system designers, and the industry software support for persistent memory is well underway. Thank you for your time. Well, that's great, Bill. Um, not unexpectedly, I think we have a few questions. So why don't we start over here? Bill, what you're talking about is almost too good to be true. <laughs> <laughs> it's faster than DRAM. It's got persistence. It's scalable. It picks up where the DRAM runs out of steam. What am I missing? <laughs> it does not go well with peanut butter or salsa. <laughs> it's not bad with a little wasabi, though. But seriously. Seriously. Um, yeah, I, I, I kind of lose sleep at night every once in a while wondering when the shoe is going to drop. Because uh, I mean, we built thousands of test chips. We have a very good understanding of how the test chips operate. Um, we haven't built a 16 gigabit device yet. Well, and nor are we going to. It'll, again, it, it, remember, it's our customer who will be um, fabricating that, and, and, but of course, you know, we'll be doing the testing with it and all. So, um, I don't know, I had, you know, maybe it's that 300 degree C limit that's the downside. Or the 100 year lifetime. Okay. The 300 year lifetime, <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So over here on this side. Yeah. Hi. Uh, great stuff. I'll, I'll try and poke a hole in that. I'll ask, like, do we have? Do you have a metric for approximate energy per bit access that I could use to compare against DRAM? Yeah, that's really a good question, um, and I probably should have in, included that in the presentation because the uh, you know, power consumption affects has a ma ma major ripple effect, right? Uh, the it tells you how big your blocks can be on your activates and so forth. So one of the implications of being a DRAM drop-in replacement means that it runs off of the same power supplies with the same or less energy than a DRAM, and that is indeed the fact. We have a five femtojoule per bit energy activation, which compares favorably to the five to seven for a DRAM cell. Over here. Uh, David Cantor, so uh, a lot of your data seemed to be for maybe an individual die. Uh, do you have uh, information on statistical variability over a uh, large sample population? Yeah, of course we do. Like beam in and et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, of course we do. Um, I, I, I chose to pull uh, like the single cell out for the resistance calculation just because it's a lot more readable than to see something with a, a lot of guard bands on it and, and it takes a lot more explanation. It just made for a simpler uh, cartoon. The accumulated data though, for example, on the uh, five nanosecond access time, that was uh, over uh, billions of cycles on thousands of devices. So that was an, uh, an accumulated all right, and generally, how would you say your, your susceptibility is to variability relative to, say, DRAM or SRAM? I, I, don't, know, I, I don't know the numbers for DRAM and SRAM that well to know. Sorry. All right, we can take it offline. Thanks. Sure. Uh, another one over here. Okay. Uh, this is a non-volatile device. Yet, I haven't heard you say one thing about security. So this is not a drop-in replacement for DRAM unless there is something to address the non-volatile nature of the device. Have you done anything about uh, encrypting this memory, or are you expecting your customers to mm -hmm. put that in their controllers? <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a great question, because the... Uh, it's a little bit frightening to have memory that lasts for 12,000 years. Um, you know, there's nothing, there is no media in the world except the stone tablet with that kind of data retention. And I'm not sure how many stone tablets 12,000 years old can still be read. Of course, I'm sure that uh, uh, Apple would have changed the algorithm by then, so we probably couldn't read it anyway. But the, you know, the, the serious answer to that is that we have these conversations with customers all the time. And keep in mind that you know, we're the IP house, we do the design of the chip. We have had the discussions about should each chip 
do in encryption. And so possible that we could add that to a version of the chip. But for the mainstream DDR4 drop-in replacement device, much like the NVDIM, which if you think about it, already, the NVDIM-N already has that permanent persistence. So the system guys are handling that themselves. The strong message that we've gotten from the majority of customers is don't screw with it. Just give us the data. We'll handle the encryption back on the processor side. However, with the growing number of direct uh, memory access architectures in flight, they're getting a different answer. And the answer there is that they want to have a centralized controller like on the NVDIM-P, but like for the OpenCAPI and Gen Z worlds that will do the encryption on that device. And again, they want a dumb, simple memory attached to that processor that will do the encryption and decryption. Another question over here? Okay. Yeah, Ron Nicholson, unaffiliated. Um, I don't know if you mentioned anything about uh, alpha particle resistance. Does this have a soft error rate with packaging, or if not, can it be used in aerospace applications where there's uh, high altitude radiation? Am I going to have to slip you a 20 for asking that question? <laughs> These devices have been sent into space, and so we actually have a phenomenal amount of data about temperature extremes, alpha and gamma, and there's nothing you can do to a carbon nanotube to get it to do something weird. The only thing it seems to be susceptible to is electrostatics, so we have electrostatic protection, and of course, the engaging and disengaging is electrostatic. Nothing else seems to affect it. Okay, one more question over here, because we're running out of time. Hi, Richard Traubin, Wave Computing, got a question. Storage is great, but you said nothing at all about the hammer you used to write the system. Um, could you explain a little bit of how we align the nanotubes uh, to jiggle up and down? Yeah, that uh, is it, it's a fairly complex formulation, and some of this information is under non-disclosure, and some is, can be public. And what I can say publicly is what I described about the length and diameter of the carbon nanotubes being selected. Part of our secret sauce is the procedures by which we formulate the CNT slurry. And we designed and built the equipment that does that, installed that at our vendors' sites, and then they cloned our machines. So they literally use our proprietary technology to do that selection of the carbon nanotube structures. Then they are tuned to the size of the puck. Each carbon nanotube cell has a certain diameter and a certain vertical height, and the length and diameter of the carbon nanotubes have to be designed to match that. But the right sense amplifier, how, do, okay. how does that process work? The right, the right amplifier that injects the electrostatic? Cell, as opposed to the memory of the, uh, and, and the construction of the, the medium. In other words, how do you flip it? Uh, yeah, the, 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 flipping, the flipping of it is an electrostatic pulse. It's, you know, a voltage is going to be applied down the word line. And, uh, and then, you know, the activation goes through an associated bit line. We have some tech, proprietary technology for how we prevent sneak to adjacent lines and crosstalk. But essentially, it's just that uh, the electrostatic force applied, which has the interesting side effect that uh, uh, writes are faster than reads, because of write, you just throw the energy down the line, and with a read, you have to throw it down, let it go through the resistive network, back out the other side through the sense amplifier. But because of the other stuff that we're doing, um, the reads and writes end up balanced by the time it gets to the IOs. So, Bill, I have uh, one more last question for you. Uh, I know you can't make commitments on the part of your customers, but <laughs> when do you think we'll be able to install these devices in our systems? Is that like this year, or is that <laughs> next year, or... The year after that, can you give well, recently, us some sense? I'm sorry, to timing? cut you off. Yeah, recently, uh, about two or three weeks ago, Fujitsu announced that they will be taking uh, CNT to mass market. So um, next year, you'll be able to get devices from Fujitsu that incorporate this technology. Uh, the DDR4 design that uh, we've completed the design, so it's now a question of fabrication, testing, 
probably a spin of the design, who knows, but uh, you know, we'll be looking at uh, next year or the year after that that customer will make that product available in the market. Okay, great. So thank you very much, Bill. Thank you. Uh, so our next talk is uh, from Mythic, uh, Analog Computation and Flash Memory for Data Center Scale AI Inference in a Small Chip. Uh, the authors are David Fick and Michael Henry. Uh, Dave is going to be the presenter. He is a CTO and co-founder of Mythic. It's an Austin startup uh, creating this next generation of AI inference microchips. Uh, uses mixed signal computation to achieve 20x to 100x improvement in neural network performance. Um, so let's uh, welcome Dave. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So just briefly about Mythic. Uh, Mythic is a high-performance edge AI startup. So we are looking at applications like computer vision and others that require a very large amount of computation on the system. We do this using analog computing and, and, and embedded flash. And so we do full stack co-design from device physics all the way up through the algorithms and applications that we're running. We co-design each of these layers together to get optimal efficiency and performance. This company was founded by Mike Henry and myself in 2012 when we were visiting scholars at the Michigan Integrated Circuits Lab in Ann Arbor. Uh, and since then, we've raised $55 million from top tier investors like DFJ, SoftBank, and Lux. Uh, we have uh, two offices, one nearby here in Redwood City, and we also have a location in Austin, Texas. And uh, currently, we're at 60 employees and growing. So I'm going to get into some pretty low-level details in order to talk about what we're doing, because um, analog compute and flash, how does that work? What does that mean? And so we have to actually look at the equations for it to make sense. Uh, shown up here is the typical operation you do in a deep neural network. You'll have, you know, we all know that neural networks have these, this graph of neurons. And uh, the question is, what does that mean in terms of mathematics? Each node of the graph is represented as a weight matrix, which is shown here in the middle. And the typical operation we're performing is taking an input vector, multiplying it by that matrix, and getting an output vector. And I'm showing here the expanded equation for the outputs of this output vector. The key operation that Aaron talks about is this multiply accumulate. So the vast, vast majority of the calculations done in the system are these multiply accumulate operations. And there's hundreds of millions or billions of these operations. And they're just this little, uh, little element right there. And it's not really, uh, not really that complicated, which is kind of interesting about neural networks. It's this great new area, but it's actually a lot of doing something very simple. And so the key, uh, the figure of merit that you talk about then in this space is how many picojoules does it take to execute one MAC operation? And so you can express the complexity of a neural network in terms of the number of MACs that it takes to execute it. And if you know the, the complexity of the network, the frame rate that you want to run, and your energy efficiency, you can uh, derive your power from that. And so this is the, the key figure of merit. There's also, uh, people talk about uh, tops per or uh, tops per watt, where one op or two ops makes up one Mac. So uh, we per, we use Mac in this uh, this presentation. So this makes it seem like the Mac itself is the hard part, and that's really not true at all. That the real issue isn't the the math required to do a multiply and accumulate. That's easy. The hard part is dealing with the data, getting to that Mac unit. So if you look at the data involved in these applications, it really breaks down into two parts. You've got the weight data to the neurons. These are the, para these are the parameters that are trained. So when you're training your neural network, you're trying to figure out what these parameters are. And they stay fixed forever until you update your application. And then you have the intermediate data. So the intermediate data is your input vector and your output vector. And at the very beginning of the network, this is your input image. And at the end of your network, the output vector is your final inference results. But then in between the stages, you also have this intermediate data. And this is changing from input to input each cycle. 
And so these two types of data are the things that we have to manage on the system, and they have different properties to them. To illustrate that, I added some numbers here where we have a, a, a neuron stage uh, where we have 1,000 inputs and 1,000 neurons. And when you have a 1,000 by 1,000 matrix, you end up with a, a million weights. Uh, when you multiply your input vector, that's going to be 1,000 elements, and your output vector will be 1,000 elements. See, the first thing that stands out is that the size of your weight matrix is orders of magnitude larger than the size of either your input or output vectors. The next thing you can look at is the way that the data is used. So when we're, when we're talking about energy per Mac, we're not really focused on what does it take to do the Mac calculation. It's really about what does it take to access that data. And so when we read x0 here, that's coming from an SRAM. And that accessing that SRAM might cost a picojoule by itself. And then the question is, well, how does that picojoule memory access from reading x0 translate to our picojoules from Mac? In this case, since it's, there's a thousand outputs, that uh, picojoule gets amortized across each of those thousand Macs. And so because of that, the contribution from reading x0 is really only one femtojoule and not really a major part. So because of that, the intermediate data accesses between neural network stages are heavily amortized on usually in a factor of 64 to 1,024x. And this is based on the number of neurons in each neural network stage. The weight data, however, does not have that property. If there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the max that are performed in the output and the, the weights that exist in the weight matrix. And these, so these are not amortized, and they could, be, uh, they could exist all the way in DRAM. So if you have to go to DRAM to access this weight, it's very expensive and time-consuming, and it doesn't get amortized in the end. So because of that, uh, DNN processing is all about weight memory. And we show some uh, common neural networks here in the table on the right. And you'll see that in the uh, weight column, this is the parameters to the network. There's tens of millions of these parameters. And this ends up being very hard to fit in an edge solution on chip. You just can't, you don't usually have tens of uh, megabytes of uh, SRAM on chip. The max here, uh, I wouldn't think of those as calculations. I would think of them as weight memory accesses that you have to pay for. And so on these applications, when you're running at 30 frames per second, then you're talking about uh, tens of billions of memory accesses each second. And then, so then the question is, how do we achieve high energy efficiency, high performance, and do that all in edge power budget, such as five watts, which is typical for like a smart camera system? <clears throat> so there's some common techniques for uh, reducing this weight energy consumption. So we can try to uh, reuse these weights. Uh, this is amortizing it similar, similarly to the way we did it with intermediate data. Uh, you can use convolutional neural networks where we take that weight matrix and apply it to multiple positions of your input. And that gives you the similar reuse quality that we had for intermediate data. And then, then you can build specialized structures around that task in order to make it even more efficient. You can also focus on large batch sizes. If you process 16 inputs in parallel, then when you access that weight uh, data, you can amortize that by 16x. Uh, by using it for each of those 16 inputs together. On the weight reduction side, the goal here is to just reduce the total number of weights in the network so you can shrink the model. Some networks are more efficient than others. SqueezeNet really tries to push the boundary there. You can compress the model, so it's using sparsity to change parameters to, to zero values, uh, up to 99% in some uh, aggressive cases. Uh, or you can use little compression in order to reduce those memory accesses. And then finally, uh, very common these days is to, re is to reduce the weight precision uh, in, in edge inference or just inference in general. 8-bit precision is the gold standard, and then you can push it down even further, maybe even to 1-bit precision. So everything comes with a cost, and uh, we can talk about those. On the convolutional neural network side, not all problems have the, the structure that is required for a convolutional neural network. These applications are taking advantage of a, a spatial symmetry in order to have that style of neural network that might not exist in many other in many applications. 
using a large batch size typically doesn't work for Edge very well because you have a small system, so processing multiple inputs is difficult. Plus, increasing the batch size also increases latency. If you have to queue up two frames or 16 frames to process them, then you have to wait for them. Uh, on the weight reduction side, each of these techniques reduces your accuracy or your capabilities. So you don't, you don't get something for nothing. So when you're adding your, your compression or your sparsity or making the model smaller, that it's going to cost you in accuracy. So then when we're architecting our system, we have a key question. Are we going to use uh, DRAM or not? So if we're designing a new system from scratch, if we choose to use DRAM, that means that we can fit arbitrarily large models. And that also means that we can uh, have much less SRAM than otherwise. So we can use SRAM as a cache, have a really big model off chip, and just kind of cache that model onto chip. The drawback from doing that, however, is there's a very large energy cost for going to DRAM. So if you're, you're backing memory as DRAM, then every time you go to DRAM, you're paying a big penalty. There's limited bandwidth for getting to there. So if you have an application that cycles through your memory very quickly, that might not work uh, from a bandwidth perspective. And then finally, your application's energy efficiency and performance becomes very uh, variable depending on the profile of the application. So how does it use that DRAM can affect its performance and energy efficiency quite dramatically. So this has led to some common uh, neural network accelerator design points in industry. Uh, you can most designs fall into one of these four categories. So the, the first metric is whether it's enterprise or edge. And enterprise systems are huge. They can have 70 to 200 watts or maybe even more. They can have tens or hundreds of megabytes of SRAM, whereas edge is trying to be really small and very low power. On the DRAM versus no DRAM side, this means that we have to either fit our entire application on chip or not. So in the enterprise with DRAM, this is like your GPUs. Uh, we don't have to have a huge amount of uh, SRAM on chip, but if we decide to go and, and do an entirely SRAM based application, then usually you'll see hundreds, uh, maybe 100 or 200 megabytes of SRAM on chip to support the full neural network application. On the edge side, uh, there isn't the opportunity to add 200 megabytes of SRAM, so then in this case, we have to make heavy use of of uh, sparsity and compression, and that degrades the application quite heavily. So what this ends up doing is you get these, uh, these are just general rules of thumb for energy efficiency for these four styles of neural network computing. And the best place to be is you want to be in the enterprise space where you can have this great accuracy, super high performance, and great energy efficiency. But we want to be able to do that in an edge system where, you know, if we want to be able to do AI processing in a camera, for instance, we can't have a 70 watt power budget. So what Mythic does is introduces a new type of memory that's non-volatile, and this allows us to uh, fit this application on chip in a much smaller power budget while still getting amazing performance, and we even get improved energy efficiency over enterprise as well. We do this in a 40 nanometer process, and that also kind of resets uh, the Moore's law for us because we'll be scaling to 28 next as opposed to five nanometer. So the way we do this is we've introduced this matrix multiplying memory, and the idea here is we're never going to read those weights. You make your weight accesses uh, zero energy, and then you don't have to worry about how much they cost at that point. By making our, en our weight access is energy free, we can eliminate the needs for large batch sizes. We can be more flexible than just convolutional neural networks. We can use recurrent. Uh, and then we can avoid sparse model or sparsity or nerf DNN models. So going back to our, I'm, I'm going to show you how this works. So going back to the matrix multiply, we have our weight matrix and we have our input vector and our output vector. We're going to represent the weight matrix using these flash transistors within a flash array. And the way we do this is each flash transistor can store a variable amount of charge on this floating gate that exists inside of it. And by storing, uh, we can store many levels on there, up to eight bits. And by storing those 256 levels on, on that die, or sorry, on that transistor, we can make it act as a variable resistor. So we have this variable resistor array, 
And so each one of these variable resistors is a flash transistor, which we can program and, and we can read it again to ensure that it has the correct value. And what we're going to do is, instead of trying to read these cells individually, we're going to apply our input vector as a set of voltages. And by applying that set of voltages on our input, we get a set of currents on the output. So the way we do that is we have our input vector represented here as x. We apply x. Uh, it changes into this vector of v, which are these voltages. Each of the neurons is, the, is a column here. It's like a bit line in the memory array. And those flash transistors are going to generate currents. And those currents will summon the bit line, and the resulting total current represents the answer to the question we were asking. And so we generate a, uh, we use ADCs to turn those currents back into digital values, and this becomes our output vector. So we never read the values in these cells. We apply voltages and get out currents, which we digi digitize back and get our output vector. Uh, the way that the cells work is we use this equation, uh, the V equals IR equation we learned in freshman year of college. And the uh, V is our input. Uh, the voltage across the resistor is our input. The weight is our resistance. And it's really kind of like uh, conductance. And so we multiply our voltage by our conductance. And that generates a current down the bit line, which is our result. The ADC itself also provides a nice nonlinearity for the, uh, the neural network calculation. The use of DACs and ADCs here also give us digital top-level interconnect. There's certain things that analog are not good at. Analog's not good at interconnect, it's not good at data storage, and it's not good at programmability. And by using the digital domain for each of these, we have a highly flexible and expandable system compared to what we'd be able to do otherwise. Additionally, for this first generation of the system, we're using a digital approximation technique for our input instead of using the DAC. And this is to just make things a little bit easier in the first generation. Uh, we process each bit individually and accumulate the result, kind of like doing math by hand. When you're multiplying, you have to do all the terms and then sum them up. Uh, but what this means, though, is that for a future generation, we have an easy uh, uh, 4 to 8x improvement without even changing the process technology by adding that DAC back in. So the way this works in the system is we take this flash array, and that's represented by this uh, large pink box here in the middle, and we pack it into a tile. We have a tile-based architecture where each tile has one of these memory arrays, and then it also has other logic to support uh, reconfiguration and, and uh, intermediate data storage. So the SRAM here provides the intermediate data storage. So between neural network stages, we store the data in SRAM. We have a RISC-V control processor, sorry, not control processor, but RISC-V processor for providing the control within the tile. We have a router uh, that's going to communicate with adjacent tiles, and then a SIMD unit that provides the operations that aren't the matrix multiply, such as max pool or average pool. These tiles get put down in a large grid. This is a very large grid for our chip, at least. Uh, we can't reprogram the flash transistors very quickly, so you'll need, to support, you'll need to have a fixed set of applications that you're running. But that's fairly typical for edge systems. We can support multiple applications by mapping different regions to different uh, applications. And so we can support several at a time. In our initial system, uh, we're aiming for a 50 million weight capacity. Uh, so like I mentioned, we don't have DRAM, so that means that there's some fixed capacity that the system can support. And for this chip, we're doing 50 million weights. Uh, we have a PCI Express 2.1 with four lanes as our interconnect off chip. And then we have a basic control processor that kind of orchestrates everything uh, in the system. Uh, we can, since this is a tile-based design, we can quickly make new variants of this product for, uh, cust for different customer needs. We can make the chip reticle-sized, and then it'll be a quarter million weight capacity. We can add additional PCI Express lanes, add USB 3. We could add direct AV interfaces. And then finally, the uh, ultimate would be adding an ARM core to make this uh, a programmable SOC for the uh, customer. 
The way this integrates into a system is that there will be some sort of host. This might be a SOC, or it could be in a workstation or a server. But that there's going to be a host system that is running the OS, running applications and interfaces. And you can see here that it might be connected to cameras. So if this is a smart camera system, you'd have Wi-Fi and a camera. And then on our chip, it will load the inference model, uh, which is specified through TensorFlow or Cafe2 or PyTorch, any of the major platforms. And so what would happen is the host SOC says, hey, I received this input image. I want to run uh, ResNet50 on it. And so a pipe res the input data over to us, so that's the image. Uh, the mythic IPU will run res at 50 and then run the, or sorry, send the inference results back over the PCI Express port. Some customers might have applications that are much larger or they want more performance than what one of these chips will provide. So multiple chips can work together to run a bigger application or run that application faster. And so, this slide is very important to us. So something we want to be clear about is that the energy efficiency that we're uh, advertising is all in. So we're including all of the, uh, the analog compute, of course, but we're also including things like the PCI Express port. This is our full accounting of all energy required to run our chip, uh, including all the digital logic and I.O. And this is also for a typical application like ResNet 50 running a batch size of one. So this is a typical use case, typical energy efficiency. Uh, for our system, uh, it's fairly application agnostic. So whether you're running convolution or recurrent or dense or whatever, it's, it's going to run about half a picojoule per max. So if you want to know how our system will uh, perform from a power perspective for your application, you can just multiply the number of max by half a picojoule, and that's our power. Uh, this is running also at 8 bit precision. We can run lower precision for individual stages if the compiler thinks it's uh, able to do that. And that will re also reduce the energy consumption as well. So this is the main value that we're providing. Uh, many of our customers are developing on a high performance GPU. They'll get an amazing amount of performance. This is in a workstation, might be like $1,000, 250 watts. And then they'll go to deploy it in their smart camera, and the the performance will just crater. And so we're, what we're providing is the ability to get that performance back and do it within a power budget that's uh, appropriate for those edge systems. Uh, for these numbers here, this is a, uh, estimated for us, this is a combination of measured silicon results for the memory array and for simulations of the top-level digital architecture. So this gives us GPU performance in uh, this edge form factor. Another application, uh, OpenPose, a similar story. We're actually exceeding the performance that the GPU can provide while, of course, using a much lower amount of power. So our timeline is we're providing to early access customers access to our software tools and profiler, at least an alpha version of those, late this year. Uh, we'll be providing uh, samples mid-next year to those early access customers in the form of these boards. Uh, There's actually a photo. Uh, they'll have between one and four IPUs. And then uh, late next year, we'll be providing BGA chips as well as PCI Express cards ranging up to 16 IPUs. So this is just a recap of the our, our IPU. Uh, so we're targeting high performance edge. So this is computer vision and other applications that require uh, very high performance, like tens of teramax a second. We're low latency, so we run a batch size of one, which translates to a single frame delay. So you're probably doing a dub double buffering system, but as the system's queuing up one frame, we're processing the previous one, or vice versa. Um, in terms of energy efficiency, we're half a picojoule per Mac and up to 500 milliwatts per, or this is the same as 500 milliwatts per teramac. So you can, if you can estimate how much performance you need, you can estimate easily how much uh, power we draw. We're ultra scalable, or we're hyper scalable, I should say, uh, from low power to high performance. So we could go down to very lightweight applications if we need to. And then finally, we're probably one of the easiest to use systems because we are topology agnostic. So we do CNN, DNN, RNN, all with equal efficiency. 
We support TensorFlow, Cafe2, and PyTorch, uh, basically any of these applications that can export Onyx or XLA. So that brings me to the end of the, my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dave. That was great. Uh, I'm sure we have a few questions. Uh, why don't we start over here? Thanks, Lee, from Anna Plush. I noticed that you have ADC for each and every columns. Any comment on the uh, speed and resolution of the ADC? Is your half because Joule per uh, map? Does that include the ADC powers as well? Yes, the half a pico joule per Mac uh, actually includes all of the power in the system, including things like the PCI Express port um, and digital storage and so on. So it is an all-encompassing power number. And the ADC runs at 8-bit resolution. So the, the entire system is an 8-bit data path. Over here. Shigel on Marvell. Um, this seems very similar to the work done at IBM Research by Nicolas and Evangelos. Just they were using the phase change memory instead of embedded flash. Can you comment on what the advantages or disadvantages of your approach versus that? So our technology is agnostic to the uh, memory structure that's used uh, inside the array. So we could use phase change instead of flash. Uh, we could use RAM. Uh, if Nantero gets some multi-level cell working, we can use carbon nanotubes. So the technology we've developed is agnostic to that. Uh, the reason why we chose Flash is because it's commercially available today. So a big focus of ours was what can we do with existing memory technologies and not have to wait five or ten years for these technologies to be qualified and ready for the market. And the other thing, so you're using an ADC to get the results. What's the accuracy of that? And are you guaranteeing that the lower bits are actually preserved? Or maybe it doesn't matter just because it's a CNN? Uh, so it's, um, it's an 8-bit ADC. Uh, I don't have like the SNDR numbers ready off the top of my head, but they're higher than 8 bits. The, uh, the, there is, you know, we don't preserve exact digital accuracy with that, of course. These applications are tolerant to some analog noise. And what we've found for our customers is that if you increase the resolution that you're running at, you'll also get an increase in accuracy. So you can trade off performance and accuracy by changing the resolution or by changing the neural network that you're running. And so by us providing a huge boost in performance, we can trade back some of that in order to, to recover the accuracy from the analog compute. Thank you. Over here. Kurt Kwitzer, UC Berkeley. I thought that was a great talk and very well thought out. But uh, I missed a couple things. Um, you say, you know, you're focusing on weights, but what about the intermediate activations? So the intermediate activations are stored in uh, SRAM. So the memory array will uh, basically get, be given a vector of data from the SRAM that's local on that tile. It'll generate an output vector which gets stored on SRAM on the tile again. So at some point, well, so intermediate activations and inputs are the other thing. You, you showed higher than image net resolution, but obviously there's a point in which the, the size of the inputs and storing the intermediate activations dominate your gain in, the, in, in your, your weights storage. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? So from the top, it's not just about weights. It's about an intermediate activations and inputs, getting inputs in and out. Yeah. So Amdahl's law at some point getting the inputs in as the resolution increases and uh, doing, storing those intermediate activations in SRAM will dominate the advantages of, of your efficient storage of weights. So typically from what we've seen, if you increase the resolution of the network, you're also increasing the amount of computation that you need to do. And so we haven't really, we haven't seen a limitation from the, uh, the I.O. coming on and off the chip, or even from the memory storage of the intermediate data. You do, uh, Google actually covered this pretty well yesterday with the Pixel application, uh, the Pixel processor. You don't need to store the entire image at a time. You can kind of work your way through it. So there, we don't see that being an issue in the near future. And typically, our customers are 
more interested and much more powerful neural networks. So things with much greater capabilities than what are available today. So they'll always want more weights. Okay, thank you. Um, well, let's take two more questions. One over here. Hey, uh, great presentation. Um, do you have any way of taking advantage of sparsity to increase the size of the model that you can, you can run? Because the regularity of your array doesn't seem to allow that. Uh, currently in this system, we are not able to take advantage of sparsity because it's like you have the full matrix. Uh, what it will do is reduce the energy consumption because those resistors aren't drawing any current. Thank you. A question. Uh, one more over here. Yeah. Compared to the sparsity, actually you, you have the like uh, maybe four, four tera operation per watt, right? Right now, it seems like a four tera operation per watt. But right now, even there's no sparsity for the like 8-bit, uh, it's around maybe two tera operation per watt. And after sparsity, maybe how do you compare to those kind of chips? Um, okay. Yeah, if no sparsity, it's still like a two tera operation per watt. And uh, if after sparsity, maybe 5x or something. Uh, so uh, the energy efficiency numbers that we listed included any sort of sparsity or are not already. We typically don't uh, attempt to use sparsity because if the value of the weight is like one or two, then it'll just draw a small amount of current and, and zeroing it out won't make that big of an impact. Okay, very good. Thank you. Well, let's thank Dave for a great talk. <laughs> Thanks.